my fourth or fifth hello to everyone. I'm Thomas Harper. I'm the senior legal advisor for the American Red Cross National Headquarters International Humanitarian Law Team. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome and thank each and every one of you for coming out to this great event on the protection of cultural property in the real world uh, with our, our great guest here, uh, Corey Wagner. Uh, I want to give Corey as much time as possible, so it's it's my pleasure to introduce her. Uh, Corey, if, if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll give just a brief bio, which does not do uh, your illustrious career just the, the slightest amount of justice. Um, but Corey is the director of the Smithsonian Cultural Re uh, Rescue Initiative. It's an outreach program dedicated to the protection of cultural heritage in crisis situations. Before coming to the Smithsonian, she was a curator at, in the Department of Decorative Arts, Textiles, and Sculpture at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. During a concurrent U.S. Army Reserve career, Corey served on several deployments, including as a civil affairs, arts, monuments, and archives officer to assist with the Iraq National Museum recovery in 2003. In 2006, she founded the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield, a nonprofit dedicated to U.S. implementation of the 1954 Hague Convention for the protection of cultural property in armed conflict, and she continues to serve as a board member with that organization. Corey is a distinguished member of the U.S. Army Civil Affairs Regiment and is an advisor and trainer for the cur uh, current 38 Golf slash 6 Victor Heritage and Preservation Officer Program. Corey has a BGS from the University of Nebraska Omaha and an and her master's degree in master's degrees in political science and art history from the University of Kansas. Corey, we want to thank you on behalf of the entire Red Cross and our IHL team for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to join us today. And the floor is yours. My pleasure to be here. So let's see here. I'm just going to try to share my screen here. Can you see that okay? Yes, we can. All right. Then let's you'll probably you'll you'll need to enter a presentation mode. Yep, that's perfect. You're oh, you're right yeah. on target. There we go. All righty. Now you just got to see it really fast backwards. Um, so good afternoon, good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, the the study of international uh, humanitarian law has long been something I've been interested in uh, as, a, as a young soldier and then later on as an Army Reserve officer. And so it's, it's really a pleasure to be invited um, to speak today. So I'm just going to kick it off with um, thinking about cultural property protection in action. So I think um, <clears throat> we talk a lot about international humanitarian law and that of course necessitates a knowledge of the law and a reading of the law that um, you know, tells everybody what, why they have to do it. So why do we have to do you know, uh, protecting civilians in armed conflict? Why do we have to protect cultural property in armed conflict? But today I'm gonna try and share a little bit of the how because often that gets left out. Well, how do you do it? Once you're convinced that you should do it, that it needs to be done, how do you do it? Um, so how did I get into this to begin with though? Um, so I'm a mild-mannered curator in um, most of my career. Uh, I do have a political science background and that's how I studied a little bit about international law during graduate school. But um, my main love was museums and art history. And so I was an art historian at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, fantastic job, my dream job for many, many years. And um, at the same time though, I kind of had a secret identity. I was an army reservist for 21 plus years. And as um, Thomas mentioned, multiple deployments. I went to Bosnia uh, for, the, for the NATO peacekeeping mission there. I served in the first Gulf War, uh, worked in Germany and got to see some of the world's most beautiful museums um, on that tour. And um, I also went to Iraq in 2003, and I'll, I'll cover that a little bit more later. And I was inspired by the story of the World War II Monuments Men. Um, and here's, if any of you have seen the film, 
Um, the book's very, very good too. And I was also inspired in grad school by the book, The Rape of Europa by Lynn Nicholas that really um, goes into great depth about the looting and destruction of cultural heritage in Europe during World War II and the formation of the fi fine arts monuments and archives teams that were active during World War II. And I really took to heart the, the lessons that I, I, that I thought I learned <laughs> from reading history, but it's really never quite the same as when you actually have to, have to do it yourself. And I didn't really realize that by becoming an arts monuments and archives officer, as they're called back when I was serving, but um, if I were deployed in that, in that role, that it would actually be probably because cultural heritage was at risk or was already damaged. And that's really kind of what, um, unfortunately, I was confronted with in 2003. I was preparing to go on a deployment to uh, Afghanistan, actually, with my uh, Army Civil Affairs Unit in Minneapolis. And uh, one morning, though, I woke up to the news that the Iraq National Museum had been looted. And I knew that we had structures in place, we had arts monuments and archives officers that should have been with that unit and we did have some. And yet it was a tragic situation where the conflict um, got out of control, looting happened in Baghdad and this was the result. And so I sort of immediately began agitating to try to get changed from my mission to Afghanistan to go to Iraq to assist uh, the unit in place there. And fortunately, I was able to do that. <clears throat> and you see here, my arrival as a, a very naive young major in 2003, and I was fortunate enough to be able to work with the military police, trying to do recovery of the looted materials with the staff there, but there was a lot to learn. And unfortunately, sort of reading about the, the way the monuments officers operated in World War II didn't necessarily prepare me for everything that I would be faced with in Iraq. And so it was kind of on the job training. Um, when I returned home in 2004, after my nine month deployment um, and working with all kinds of colleagues uh, for, in, the, in the allied forces, Italian carabinieri, working with the British uh, colleagues from the British Museum and, and others, and, and basically be becoming the pseudo Ministry of Culture for Iraq during the occupation and then uh, and serving as a liaison there with the military. And then um, helping the transition to the new government of Iraq and working with the Ministry of Culture staff. I learned a lot about what had not happened um, correctly and, and what went right and what went wrong, as we say, and was determined when I got home to change it. And so one of the things that I really noticed was that, or I was made aware of pretty quickly, is that the United States at that time, while we followed the 1954 Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property and Armed Conflict as customary international law, we were not actually members of the treaty. Um, it had been signed um, by uh, President Bill Clinton uh, the, a decade before, but unfortunately it had never been ratified by the Senate. And so we're operating under, under the rules, the, the laws of armed conflict or international humanitarian law. However, um, the, the knowledge of how to do that and the training that the military should have had just wasn't there. And so, um, when I got home, I was really determined that we should do something about that. And uh, I got together with like-minded people from the archeological community, from other art museum curators, um, from the conservation of artworks community of professionals. And we put together an organization called the US Committee of the Blue Shield. And our goals were to train military personnel as they were getting ready to deploy because this is the early to mid 2000s. Now we're in 2006 when we formed the Blue Shield and recognize that those civil affairs units and other types of units that were deploying back to, to Iraq in a high op tempo, um, places like Afghanistan, Somalia, the Horn of Africa, 
all the deployments around the world that as units were deploying, they needed to have some of this basic cultural property protection training and understand their responsibilities under the Hague Convention and how to work with the colleagues on the ground who may be trying to protect their heritage. So that was one of our goals. And the other goal was to actually lobby to get the United States to ratify the Hague Convention. And so we were very fortunate that um, we were able to realize that goal in 2008, the Senate voted to ratify the 1954 Hague Convention and it actually was put into place by depositing our instrument of ratification with UNESCO in 2009. UNESCO is the international body that administrates the 1954 Hague Convention, which now has 133 states, parties, or countries that are members of the treaty. And then there are also protocols. There's a first and second protocol. The US are, is not a member of those protocols at this time, um, but I think it's, it's gaining steam. Um, the second protocol has, I think, 84 countries that are members that, that kind of strengthen the, the convention, make it a little bit more strict. Uh, and it also requires a little bit more effort um, on the part of each country domestically to work during times of peace, to train their armed forces and to um, plan to protect their own cultural heritage domestically on the ground in case of an armed conflict. And consequently, it also works pretty well to protect against all types of disasters that could impact cultural heritage. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about sort of three case studies today, and I'll try to keep them brief. Um, I have a lot of pictures, but I'm gonna try to keep it brief because I wanna have time for questions. But I'm gonna talk about the, the looting of the Iraq Museum in a little bit more detail and the work that colleagues on the ground did to try to protect their cultural heritage when they were facing an armed conflict. I'm also gonna talk about colleagues that we worked with um, at the Smithsonian and our partners at the University of Pennsylvania on a project called Safeguarding the um, Heritage of Syria. And then finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about when cultural property protection in armed conflict fails. Um, it failed a little bit um, for the Iraq National Museum, but it failed utterly for the Mosul Museum. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what happens when cultural property protection fails and how we have to work on the recovery of that to document the potential for a war crime. So without further ado, the looting of the Iraq Museum. Um, a lot of you were probably pretty small when this happened, um, but it was headline news all over the world um, as the US was uh, driving in to invade Iraq. Baghdad had a lot of looting around the city, and in particular, the Iraq National Museum was targeted. The Iraq Museum is the flagship museum for the whole country of Iraq, and many of the collections that are excavated in archaeological sites all over the country went there for safekeeping. And several, many of the regional museums sent collections there for safekeeping, so it was particularly awful that that building was um, broken into and looted. You see here a lot of um, sort of cultural heritage objects were targeted because they didn't conform with this with the standards, maybe of Islam that some people see as as very important. And so, rather than looting some objects, they were simply smashed and destroyed. These are um, sculpture um, from uh, an archaeological site that's more of a Roman era site in Iraq, and a lot of. Uh, a lot of the galleries we noted, they, they seem to not necessarily have had the objects looted. You see here are lines and lines of empty cases. And we learned later that the colleagues, as they were preparing, watching the US invasion getting ready to take place, they went in secret into the galleries and they packed up a lot of the collections and they hid them, they evacuated them to a secret storage location. So again, this idea of cultural property protection in action, these, the staff took action to try to protect their collections. And you see here in the upper left, um, Dr. Donnie George Ukana. He was uh, the research director at the museum and later became the director of the museum. He was um, a Christian and um, had a lot of, a lot of um, 
difficulties to surmount in, in his career uh, due to that. And he eventually immigrated to the United States and um, he unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but he was a real leader in the protection of the Iraq National Museum, working with his colleagues in the leadership and hiding objects as best they could in that lead up to war. So some of the measures that they took, I just, I'm, I'm making a list here uh, because I lecture about this a lot and there are some really basic practical things that you can do. Um, so um, noting that a lot of the collections moved from the regional museums to Baghdad and they stored many of those collections in storage magazines in and around the, the building and then they actually sealed over them with plaster so that the doorways to those storage magazines would be harder to find. <clears throat> the looters had some knowledge of where the storage locations were. That's often the case when museums are, are stolen from or broken into is that the, the looters may have some insider information, people who used to work there, whatever, but they were able to break into some of those. But for the most part, the collections that were stored there were crated up except for fairly recent excavations. And unfortunately, those were basically laying around on, on um, shelving, waiting for cataloging, photography, et cetera. But the museum hadn't been in, in full operation for quite some time due to the UN sanctions against Iraq um, and the inability to pay staff, et cetera. And then of course, the threat of war kind of tends to keep people at home as well. So um, they, but what they were able to do is they sandbag the galleries, they laid down foam mattresses to try to prevent damage to, to um, sculpture if, it were to, if the building were to be bombed. They made um, careful records and references about where they stored objects away from when they were taken off site. Um, they, create, they took the library movable shelving, the kind that you do the crank and the, and the shelves move back and forth. They used a welder to weld those shut so that people wouldn't be able to steal the books. And as I mentioned, they walled over some of the storage magazines and they, they sealed windows and doors with concrete blocks. So just very much like you see here. And that was good because the looters did um, break into the concrete block. It's, it's pretty secure, but not fully. And they were able to breach that window by breaking out the concrete blocks. The staff later resealed it. But here you see some of the sandbagging that they did along in the, the galleries that have um, freezes from Nimrud. It's one of the most important archeological sites in Iraq. And unfortunately in 2015 was actually um, heavily, heavily damaged by ISIS, purposely damaged. So it's good that these um, freezes are still in the Iraq National Museum in Baghdad. Uh, you see here the use of foam. Um, this, this one is, wasn't maybe entirely effective, but this um, sculpture did remain intact. And they had a lot of much thicker mattresses that they laid around um, sculpture that was uh, permanently installed around in the building. Things that they couldn't move, they tried to protect in situ or on the site. Um, they also stored things offsite. As I mentioned, this is the Iraq National Bank, where we later were able to recover a lot of the material, um, the high value material, like the treasure of Nimrud. You see here one of the amazing uh, queen's crowns from the treasure of Nimrud. And so those remained intact. And that's, that's me with the frowny face in the background, um, thinking about the, that we're about to pass this crown around and maybe that's not the best curatorial method. But um, we also uh, worked, uh, at, so after we arrived, we continued to work with the staff to increase the security around the museum to ensure that we didn't have a second looting attack later on. And so raised the, the heights of the fences and the gates, added locks to the gates, raised the wall around the compound. This is a very large compound in downtown Baghdad. And then uh, a lot of work to secure the storage magazines with, um, with iron bars and by welding them shut. It's, it's not the best methodology if you can avoid it because sometimes sealing off areas if you lose power and you don't have good ventilation, you can get mold and mildew, but it's a case where um, 
it's, you know, you have to balance the risk uh, and the, and the um, of protecting versus the long-term damage. So you don't want to have it sealed up longer than you have to. Um, I mentioned the case of the, of the Safeguarding the Heritage of Syria project. And in particular, what we wanted to do was try to help Syrian colleagues who were in non-government controlled parts of Syria. The government controlled parts of Syria could receive help from the international community like colleagues at UNESCO, but because of the um, difficulties of being in the non-government controlled areas, it was very hard for colleagues who still had responsibility for museums and cultural sites to get assistance. And so we worked with um, the International Council of Museums. We worked um, the University of Pennsylvania and the Smithsonian started uh, talking to Syrian expatriate colleagues that were already here in the United States who had been staff in the Ministry of Culture. And we started to figure out a plan for how we could help colleagues stranded in these areas. And you see here the front doors to the Mara Museum, which had already been broken into a couple of times. So what we settled on doing was uh, our, our colleague Salam Al-Kuntar, Dr. Al-Kuntar was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. You see her in the center. She's the only person in the picture that doesn't have her face blurred out. Um, uh, Salam was, was our real uh, touch point on all of this and also Dr. Amr Al-Azam. And uh, we met our colleagues who crossed over the border from Syria into Turkey, and we did a training for them, a three-day training. And we worked with them to sort of prioritize their cultural protection activities that they wanted to undertake. And they settled on, oh, and these are, these are the activities basically um, to offer information about how to, how to work safely during emergency, and um, to secure your collections and to also purchase basic supplies and packing materials for them that they could work with to be able to put their um, collections in safe storage or relocate them if necessary. And then to talk about emergency response and needs for the long term. And a lot of times the, um, some of these colleagues were in different parts of Syria and they hadn't actually seen each other in quite a while. So it was also a bit of a, uh, of a wrong contrast, so to speak. Um, so this is the, the project that they decided that they really wanted to focus on for this training was the Mara Museum, which is in Idlib province. And it's uh, filled with immovable, um, immovable mosaics that were actually excavated in an area in the World Heritage Site of the Dead Cities. And these um, span a, a pretty big chunk of time and some of them are, are more Christian in nature, some of them are classical, and all of them highly fragile and highly at risk and permanently installed to the walls and the floors in this building. You see that uh, see the interior of the museum in better times in peacetime. And so we worked on um, basically teaching a lot of the methodologies that the monuments men of World War and women of World War II have handed down to us. And you see here my colleague Brian Daniels from University of Pennsylvania teaching some packing and crating methods. And also we talked a lot about how to sandbag um, to protect uh, paintings, mosaics, and other in situ flat art. And so you, here you see um, that, that method used in Milan, Italy for Da Vinci's Last Supper. And that building was actually bombed. And you see here uh, on the right hand side, the, the boarded up sandbagging actually preserved that. And that's why you can go and see that fabulous painting in Milan even today. So that cultural property protection methodology is very important. And so we went around shopping at all the hardware stores in this town in Turkey, and we were able to find a lot of the supplies we needed in basic hardware stores. You know, you can, you can buy super expensive conservation materials if you're in New York City or Washington DC, but um, sometimes you have to take what you can get when it's armed conflict. And so we were looking for things like bubble wrap, Tyvek house wrap, which uh, we needed to try and preserve the mosaics in place. And so here you see our colleagues, we needed to buy gallons and gallons of glue, just plain old white glue. And um, the idea was to adhere uh, 
Tyvek basic white waterproof house wrap with glue to these mosaics and then sandbag over that. So the, the Tyvek protects, as you see here, sometimes they ran out of Tyvek and they had to use sheets, um, plain cotton sheets. Um, but you can see the methodology and then by protecting them with that glue, even if a bomb blast hit, it holds the, the mosaics to the wall and, and you keep the pieces together instead of shattering them throughout the room. And here you see, it might not be as pretty as the one over the Last Supper during World War II, but very effective because unfortunately this museum was hit by barrel bombs uh, on several occasions actually, and, and only a few months after they did the sandbagging project. You see here that how effective the sandbags were in holding everything in place. The bomb blast from this blast outside actually knocked the sandbags off the wall, but it held, it adhered, and they were able to just rebuild the wall. And then finally, um, my case study about the Mosul Cultural Museum. So what happens when things really go wrong? And um, I'm sure that it wasn't that long ago, a few years ago, that we all saw on the news and on YouTube pictures of, of ISIS, the so-called Islamic State, um, smashing up collections throughout uh, Iraq and Syria during their, during their short-lived reign of terror. And here you see pictures of them smashing up actual uh, original sculptures. Some, there were a few reproductions in there, but most of the sculpture that was not movable that had been um, left in the museum, most of the movable collections had been moved to the National Museum in Baghdad, as I mentioned earlier, in 2003 ahead of the US invasion. And so most of those materials were safe in Baghdad, but here you see a lot of the immovable collections were smashed by ISIS, but so, so much worse, they did damage with explosives and with fire. And they burned the entire library collection of the museum and as well used explosives to blow up large scale sculpture like the, um, on the left, you see this amazing Lamassu and uh, along the wall, and then on the on the floor, you see a throne dais from Nimrud, and they used explosives to blow those up and then further smash them with, with hammers. And so the, the question was, what do you do when you're getting ready to prepare to go in and help colleagues with the salvage and recovery of this museum and of this collection as much as we can, you know, the best we can, we realize this is a crime scene. The, these are crimes against humanity, crimes against cultural property, and crimes against the 1954 Hague Convention. So, so what can you do to be sure you document this um, and make sure that it's not forgotten, make sure that if there is a trial, if the perpetrators are caught, if there's a war crimes tribunal, that that information about what happened there remains. And so um, we realized that we needed help with this and the Smithsonian teamed up with the FBI art crime team and um, their evidence collection uh, unit and we evidence response team unit. And they trained us about how to do a very um, forensic type methodology to document the damage at the Mosul Cultural Museum. And this is something that we're working on to publish so that others can um, learn from some of our, uh, from what we've learned and some of our mistakes as well. And so you see here us, we're in Erbil in this photo, working with our Iraqi colleagues and making the plan for how to do this work um, very carefully and, and definitely working directly with the, with the museum staff because we wanted everything to be exactly what would be useful for them in the future. We also brought engineers with us uh, from the Czech Republic who were working in Iraq at the time and they were able to establish that the building was stable enough for us to work in and in fact, luckily stable enough for them uh, to for it to be rebuilt in the future. And that's the process that's happening now. But this was the first step, first document before you touch anything, just like in the movies. And we documented it as a cold case crime scene, more or less. And here's, a, here's the, um, the materials that we brought with us to make sure we knew where we were going. We did an initial assessment 
and reviewed a lot of photos and everything. So we would have a very good idea of what we'd be up against, how long it would take. And then on the, on the day, we, we spent two different days doing this and um, we were able to get through it pretty quickly in a couple of days because we had a plan we had a really good plan. And here you see, we're documenting it like a cold case crime scene. We were putting down evidence numbers, just like you see in the movies. We found a lot of evidence of different types of explosives use. We found small arms, fire um, cartridges, uh, we found a lot of documentation of ISIS's occupation of the building that was all kept. And so um, here you see the, the hole in the floor that um, was caused by explosives. We've collected a lot of explosives residue, et cetera. And um, now we have all that evidence. We took more than 4,500 photos in the building and the grounds and then the exterior of the building as well, plus video and um, and then we worked with the staff to try to figure out where pieces are missing. So sometimes um, it was clear that there was not uh, rubble of, of the pieces lying around. So either they'd been carried off after the occupation by ISIS, or they would maybe even be car been carried off by ISIS. So we're working really closely with the staff to figure out what was missing and where we still had fragmented pieces of objects. And then they carefully, um, we have a methodology that we do normally in museum or any kind of disaster for cultural heritage, not just museums, but a methodology that um, the Smithsonian helped develop along with the International, um, the International Conservation Center in Rome, ECROM, about how to, how to basically divide up a space in grids and make sure that you pick up pieces and document them with photography and numbering systems so that you know where each broken piece was found within the building and then um, box it up according to locations. And so that's what you see the staff is doing here. Um, so training, how, how can we, um, those, those are my case studies kind of thinking about how you do this, but obviously people just don't know how to do this overnight. And it's not really something you learn how to do in art history grad school, believe it or not. And so um, part of what we really do at the Smithsonian is try to train colleagues in doing this work. Um, as I mentioned, we've done uh, work with the with ECROM in Rome and developed the um, first aid for cultural heritage and crisis courses, and also with our colleagues, the Prince Klaus Fund Cultural Emergency Response. And um, we've trained uh, dozens of people from around the world and we're continuing to train. Uh, whenever we get a chance, we also have a domestic program called HEART, Heritage Emergency and Response Training uh, for, for colleagues at museums and collecting institutions here in the US. And so learning that methodology, it's kind of basic. It's kind of like learning first aid for people, right? It's first aid for cultural heritage. And um, so I wanted to just kind of go over some of the considerations about armed conflict not in great detail, but thinking about things like um, that, that are different in conflict maybe than in a naturally caused disaster. You're thinking about how culture and people's identity is at an increased risk of attack sometimes in conflicts um, where it might not be in natural disasters. Um, staff might not be available when violence erupts or they might not be willing to, to come, uh, you know, to drive miles through checkpoints and things like that. So oftentimes there does need to be some outside help. You have to think about the international treaties like the Hague Convention, but also local and national laws that govern how cultural property, because it is property, are impacted um, and, and what you can do as, as a, a first responder coming from outside the country or, or military coming from outside the country. Um, there are a lot, again, lots of actors involved, military first responders, cultural heritage professionals who don't often interact with each other on a regular basis. There may be political issues like, um, like the Iraq museum staff face that if they were seen to be publicly be evacuating collections from the building, that would have you know, gotten them in trouble with the Saddam regime because it would look like they didn't have faith in the idea that the Iraqi forces would beat the US forces. So that's why they had to do it in secret. Um, this is high stakes for decisions make, decision makers 
who are responsible ultimately for cultural heritage, but they may not know very much about it. Maybe it's the mayor of a town or the governor of a state might not know so much about it, but when cultural heritage is damaged, suddenly, you know, it's a problem for them. And then a lot of people don't like to plan for the worst case scenario. We don't like to plan for our own funerals most of the time. Uh, we don't like to plan for what, you know, what kind of insurance we need if our house goes completely underwater. Well, cultural heritage professionals don't always like to plan for whether, you know, if they're going to have a fire and really don't like to plan about if their museum is overtaken by armed conflict. So we have to kind of break down the barriers on that. And then um, finally, you might have to improvise. You might have to use foam mattresses instead of high density foam that's conservation, you know, appropriate and things like that. And you might not be able to use the, the materials for as long because they're not as stable as conservation uh, correct materials. And then thinking about planning. So there are a lot of things that you can do ahead of time you know, don't wait until you have a disaster, you should plan and mitigate and then maybe you can even avoid the disaster if you plan appropriately. So documentation, storing thing, storing that documentation and offsite, it doesn't do any good to have photos of your collection if they're then burned at the same time the collection is burned. Developing emergency plans, having volunteers to help you locally that you can trust and who will tell you of early warning in case they see the conflict coming. Um, considering taking call, um, collections and evacuating them to safer areas, to higher ground, further inland, thinking about you know, if, if the conflict is coming toward you, having a plan for where your collection can go if you have time to move it or how you would protect it in place. And think about those worst cases. And then uh, a lot of cultural institutions have security personnel who may not have thought very much about how they would work with first responders or with the military in an armed conflict situation, but, but some excellent training could really help alleviate that problem. Planning for evacuation and rehousing, that's, that requires everybody on the staff to kind of understand how to do that. And then thinking about, again, how you protect immovable collections with really specific plans, like having these kind of materials available, how do you, boarding up windows, and this it's the same methodology to board up windows essentially as if you're, if you're having a hurricane, as you know, if you're having an armed conflict, these are good skills for a museum or any kind of collecting institution to have. And then finally, keep planning, training, rehearsing, and repeating. So I just wanted to, uh, wrap it back around to the Hague Convention for a minute, because also there are obligations that the military has under the Hague Convention, just like I did um, when I went to Iraq. And it's basically to have, um, have it in your military regulations and also to have armed forces, services, or specialist personnel in your military whose job it is to do, to do the cultural property protection and help the civilian authorities in that country. And the, the Hague Convention really brought this up because of the successes of the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives officers in World War II. And you see some of those here in this photo. And so, you know, they're not born also in the military knowing about the responsibilities of the Hague Convention. And just like Geneva Convention and the protection of civilians, there needs to be training. And it has to be a consistent, you know, uh, drumbeat of training all the time. And so I also train civilians on how to work with the military as well. Um, but we've had a lot of trainings uh, since the Blue Shield started and so many museums and cultural institutions like the Smithsonian have actually really seen that it is a responsibility of cultural heritage professionals as well. If not us, who is gonna talk about what is cultural property and why is it important? and how do you care for it? And not, yeah, it's not just the why, it's the how, how you care for it. And so we've had programs at the Met, as I was just showing here, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, this is one that we had at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. Um, we've, we've printed up guide books for um, the US military and, and allied forces. And then most recently, the Smithsonian really went all in by doing an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, 
with the U.S. Army Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command, my old unit, USA KPOC. And here you see my boss, Dr. Richard Curran, signing that MOU with General Jeffrey Coggin, who was the commanding officer of the unit. And then um, on the right, that's me with Colonel Scott DeJesse, who is the head of the modern day monuments officers, the 38 Gulf Six Victor program. I know why does the army have to do all these um, job titles that are, are alphanumeric, but at any rate, um, we, we signed that MOU in 2019. And then um, we, we've done quite a bit of online training with the, with the new monuments officers. We haven't been able to do a lot in person because of COVID. But um, for those of you, I know we have a lot of um, aspiring, perhaps um, maybe aspiring military people. I know that, that there's the Red Cross um, Junior ROTC group. And so think about it. If you've ever thought you might wanna be a monuments officer, uh, you need a master's degree in a relevant field of work like art history or museum conservation or um, architecture and you need five years of relevant work experience, or you could go directly into the army and get a bunch of work experience, but you really need to get the, um, the cultural heritage civilian experience because that's, that's what they want. The, the civil affairs is all about bringing people into civil affairs as army reservists who have a civilian skill that the army doesn't otherwise have. And so that's why all of the monuments officers within use of KPOC are army reservists. And then finally, you have to be meet the same physical standards as anybody else who's in the army, but they are hiring. And um, think about it if that's something you might aspire to in the future. Um, have a look. So that's it for me. I'll stop there, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Corey. Uh, that was a really fascinating presentation, and uh, what I what I really really loved about it is that we're getting a peek uh, into stuff as it happened. Uh, these are, are not pictures pulled from a textbook. These are your real life experiences, which is is really unique. Um, we do have a few questions, and then I have a, a few that are tailored for folks that will be watching this recording and doing guided events later on, whether in the our YAC program, JROTC or otherwise. But let's get to the audience questions first. Uh, you mentioned, and the first question comes um, from an attendee that asked uh, whether the failure to protect, quote unquote, uh, was that the IHL violation or was the IHL violation the actual looting itself? Well, that's a really good question. Um, not being a lawyer myself, I'll let the some of the Red Cross team maybe talk about that. But um, what for for the Iraq National Museum? Um, I would say that the, I don't know that the looting necessarily constituted a war crime. It was definitely criminal activity and a lot of the looted materials. Um, we had a, a group called the JIASIC, the Joint Interagency Coordinating Group, um, led by Colonel Matthew Bogdanos, and, and he's written about his time there. Um, to track things down. And we had a lot of customs enforcement people, et cetera. So I don't think anybody was prosecuted uh, as, as like a tribunal type situation, but um, the, the failure to protect the museum extends to a lot of parts of Baghdad. And, you know, that, that's a, a whole nother, you know, semester long IHL class, I think. But, um, you know, it, it was a really, we knew where the cultural sites were, and yet we just didn't have, and, and uh, the same thing with lots of places in Baghdad, they just weren't adequately protected. And I think that for some reason, the we were told to, more to expect mass movements of, of civilians and the difficulties that come with that. And, and I, I think that the looting kind of took people a bit by surprise, honestly. Now, compare and maybe a related question as an offshot, and this is just coming from me, not an attendee. Uh, in in your time uh, since that experience early on in in Operation Iraqi Freedom, have you seen uh, a, a push internally, either as a reservist or now as a civilian, uh, to to 
uh, address some of those shortcomings, maybe to, to uh, maybe uh, in situations where cultural property is in the crosshairs, uh, to be a, m a little more sensitive about providing protection to it in combat zones? Yeah, definitely. Um, I was, I'm just thinking about um, after the Haiti, well, not, that's not a combat zone, but after the Haiti earthquake, there was kind of a rush um, by the um, MINUSTA, the UN peacekeeping force there. I mean, it wasn't an active armed conflict, but it was definitely a stabilization mission by MINUSTA. And then also right away, um, US Southcom became involved. And there was a lot of sensitivity surrounding the cultural heritage and the Smithsonian had uh, a project there right away working with the, um, uh, the Haitian Ministry of Culture. But um, we did get some assistance from the, the US military task force there as well as MINUSTA providing assistance. So I think, I think awareness was raised about the need for protection of heritage in those, in those first days after, in, whether it's conflict or a, big, a natural disaster. And I also know that it had a significant effect of really raising awareness such that the US was just a few years later, able to ratify the Hague Convention, for sure, that made a big difference. Absolutely, and, and it's, it's a shame that events like that sometimes have to, are, are the drivers, the catalyst for uh, change like that. We have a question uh, from another attendee that relates to the, the sort of modern monuments men that you spoke of. Are monuments officers only commissioned officers or does it also include, do their ranks also include non-commissioned officers, meaning enlisted personnel for those that are not familiar with the rank structure? Right, um, at, right now the 38 golf program, which is a, a subset of civil affairs officers is only commissioned officers. Um, civil affairs has NCOs, but not as the 38 golf program. Um, we, we, there are opportunities for um, NCOs, non-commissioned officers to transition over and get the direct commission. Um, and it, it is a, a board, uh, board run panel looks at the education experience, et cetera, and grants the 38 golf. And then the direct commission happens in the same way it does for other commissioned officers like Medical Service Corps or the um, JAG Corps. Great, thank you. Another question, it, this is gonna be US based, but did you have any role either training or response in protecting the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library this year from the California wildfires? No, I was not involved in that, but um, so we do work as we co-chair with FEMA, a group called the Heritage Emergency National Task Force. And so the Smithsonian is often asked to provide uh, cultural heritage expertise as part of that work. And um, we responded to things like the after hurricanes Irma and Maria, we did a lot of, of uh, emergency work and training in the US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. We did uh, programs at disaster recovery centers for the public about saving their family treasures. All, all over the sort of southeastern seaboard, et cetera. So we do a lot of that kind of work. Okay, thanks. Another question from an attendee. Uh, can you discuss the, the case of military necessity in, in uh, the strike on Monte Cassino in World War II? I know that's, that's a, pretty, a pretty big question overall, but uh, maybe if, if you can give attendees uh, just a snapshot of what Monte Cassino sure. was. That's well, of I'll heavily simplify it. But um, I, I honestly, that used to be a case study, I mean, in, in going to your captain's qualification course, right? Um, and talking about IHL. And I don't, think, I don't think it gets talked about as much as it used to when I, as when I was an officer. But so Monte Cassino was a, a, basically a, a fortress, a, a, a monastery. I, I can't remember which, um, whether it was Benedictine or what it was. But it was a monastery in Italy up on a really high, uh, basically uh, almost a mountain. And it was in the way of the US progress to go north during the invasion of Italy. And the Germans had occupied the, the mount. And uh, from, from the observation points and everything, it looked to 
U.S. forces as though they were actually inside the monastery, which means it would have lost its sort of protection under international law and thinking about, you know, not, not using cultural heritage sites for a military purpose. And so, um, and a lot of U.S. Uh, military personnel had died in the months and months of the standoff where this, you know, this was in the way, basically. And um, the the territory was really, really difficult. The weather was terrible. People were dying. And so there became a lot of political pressure to take out the monastery, even though it was this ancient cultural place. And um, eventually that's what happened. And um, it turned out, though, that the monastery wasn't actually being occupied by the German forces. And actually, um, the attack on it and the subsequent destruction made it much more of a fortifiable place. And, and actually, the battle was even worse after that. And many more US um, soldiers lost their lives after that. So um, it's that 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 figuring out the military necessity, and they determined that it was a case of military necessity that it had to go because, you know, the the military advantage of destroying it would outweigh the loss of the site. Basically, I'm I'm greatly simplifying this, but so it is a good case for reminding people when they're trying to determine, you know, and it and it needs to be determined at a at a pretty high level, um, as it was with Monte Cassino, but. You know, if you're thinking about military necessity, make sure that you know what you're talking about and that you have as many of the facts as you can get because you could be wrong and go down in history and people are still talking about it all these decades later. The, the lesson modern uh, for, for modern commanders is have your monuments officer close, have your JAG uh, just as close to advise you on those things. Right. Um, so another question here from Jill Hoffman. Jill, thanks for coming out for this. Uh, how do you identify responsibility for action of dest uh, destruction of cultural property? I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I understand. I, I suppose it's it's how do you how do you identify who's responsible? Maybe can you speak to uh, methods by which uh, those in the field uh, can ah. peg responsibility for? Okay. Yeah. So I, it's. I think with modern technology, there are a lot of methods that you can use and something that, that a lot of academic institutions and including the Smithsonian did some work on this um, with, with, the, with ISIS and that's using satellite imagery. When sites are destroyed, you can look at, you can look at social media, you see you know, people putting photos out. So there are a lot of open source things that you can look at to, to kind of see when there's an event you can also just, you know, comb through all kinds of different news sources. And then if you can get a hold of satellite imagery, which, you know, governments have it, uh, private, private industries have it, et cetera. And then you can kind of look at a, a moment in time of that site. And then what we did is we backed up the imagery, look at it the day before that and the day before that. And you can see what vehicles are in the area, what kinds of, of uniforms, um, how many people do you see heavy equipment in those photos? Who's driving it, etc. So, you know, there, unless you can get out from under the sky, people are watching you when you're doing these kinds of, of heinous activities. And it's often pretty easy to back up and identify potential parties who are responsible. And I would imagine the advent of social media you see things like some of these acts being live streamed, recorded, and and in, in uh, some cases proudly posted from the folks that are committing these acts, and uh, that that can certainly be evidence down the line. Uh, we have another question here. I'm gonna from Andrew Moss. I'm gonna paraphrase here. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, modern monuments officers. Um, are they are they clustered? Are they assigned to a particular unit? Do, I mean, are they assigned to sort of a, a civil affairs command out of, say, Fort Bragg in North Carolina, or do they have uh, units that they belong to across the United States and globe? Right. So they they're all located within the U.S. Army Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command, which are which is a reserve Army Reserve Command, and um, they're the CA commands are located both on the east and west coast. 
And then there are a number of brigades and, and battalions all spread across the United States. And so the, the, the monuments officers are, are basically assigned to those units. And then if they deploy for that purpose, they would deploy probably with a civil affairs unit rather than, you know, as I did, I went to join a civil affairs command that was already in place in Baghdad and I joined that unit. So that's usually how it will work. And the, the, uh, just to directly answer you, Andrew, he, he asked about specific, um, monuments men out in Alaska. Uh, do you know, is there a civil affairs reserve unit up in Alaska that you know of, uh, the assignment process for the army reserve is very, very different. Yeah, I don't know. I, that's a good question. I don't know if there's a civil affairs unit in Alaska, but um, you know, generally speaking, you can you can be in a in any civil affairs unit across the country. But ideally, they like to see the 38 golfs, the civil sector experts, because there's more than just for the monuments officers. There are ones about you know uh, city planning and energy and and all the kinds of um, the civil sector specialties that you would need um, to, to work with the civilian community in a country. Um, so yeah, that's a really good question, but you would, you would join your local civil affairs unit, but they like to have those 38 golfs at the command level or the brigade level. And the unique thing just for the, the respite, I still serve in the army reserves. The unique thing about the reserves is that unlike active duty where you're assigned to a base and you live there, uh, many reservists will serve any unit that's not geographically close to you. That can be more challenging if you live in a state like Alaska, uh, but there's uh, it just works a little bit differently in the Army Reserve. So there's some yeah, I used to I used to live in Minneapolis and drill in Chicago for a long time. And that was fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. We have a, uh, we'll take one more audience question we have here. Then I have a couple from my end, and and I want to close uh, by promoting our our essay and art competition. Uh, the comment from the attendee here says, thank you very much for your presentation. Have you organized any public outreach program or programs to educate community in Iraq about their history? And I, I assume they mean uh, maybe Iraqis uh, help educate them about their, uh, their history. Yeah, so the Smithsonian doesn't really do that. It's the, it's the Iraqi Ministry of Culture colleagues that we work with who are doing that kind of work and, and working to... They've, they've been having some public events at the Mosul Cultural Museum to kind of inspire people to get ready for the um, reconstruction and reopening of that building. And they've also been working with um, members of the local community in some of the other areas. They're working on um, the recovery of the archaeological site at Nimrud. They, want, they definitely want to involve the local community in that. That was one of the most visited cultural sites in Iraq by Iraqis before it was destroyed by ISIS. So um, that's, there's definitely a lot of planning in the works to help people reconnect with all those cultural sites that they, that they really cared about prior to ISIS. Great. Well, I have just one last question for you before I do a shameless plug of our essay competition. And that's, uh, there are a lot of young IHL advocates, uh, young students, high schoolers, middle schoolers, college students that are learning about IHL through this program. And this year, our theme is the protection of cultural property. What advice do you have for, for these young students who might be just opening up Pandora's box and, and thinking about uh, possibly a career in your field or getting more involved in advocacy for this type of issue? Yeah, so there are a lot of um, different groups out there you can join. There's the Lawyers Committee for Cultural Heritage Protection, LCCHP. They kind of, I think they have a law competition every year. Um, there are groups like the Blue Shield um, to, to kind of keep up on, on what's happening with cultural property protection and the Hague Convention. And I think just um, kind of paying attention to also your local heritage. I mean, every... I talked to a lot of people who are excited about how you save heritage in armed conflict, but it all starts at home, right? We, we're supposed to be working. You can be part of the Hague Convention because we're all supposed to be working during times of peace for planning and, um, uh, and protecting our own cultural heritage. So, you know, 
go go to your local museum, ask them what they're doing. Um, go to your local first responders and say, wow, what do we do to protect heritage if we have an earthquake here, et cetera. And then branch out from there and do what you are most interested in. Thanks so much, Corey. It really means the world to have somebody of your stature and, and uh, your experience take time to join our team here. I want to thank you on behalf of the American Red Cross and, and all of our attendees here. We had about 100 people uh, in, in attendance today, which is really fantastic. I, I want to share something that, that uh, Corey has been a uh, part of behind the scenes really helping us on and continues to do so. Uh, we have the Red Cross has its annual IHL essay and art competition uh, that's going on right now as we speak. Uh, we're accepting entries uh, up until January 28th, 2022. The competition is open to high school students, undergrad students, uh, and graduate students to include law students. And our theme, uh, quite aptly, is the protection of cultural property. And so we're soliciting entries, uh, both essay on the essay and art side, on this theme. Uh, we're not drawing it down to a particular topic within cultural property. We leave that to you, the entrant, uh, to decide what's most important. What do you want to speak to within the issue, the, the broad set of issues with the protection of cultural property under IHL? We have some great prizes. And, and most importantly, uh, your work gets seen, uh, these entries get seen by a host of IHL experts to include Corey, who's going to help us judge our finalists and pick a winner uh, in, in each of these categories on the essay side. And uh, the winners will have a chance to have their, their entries published in a very special American Red Cross digital magazine, which will come out in the spring. Uh, if you need more information, I know that button doesn't work on your screen, but the rules can be found at rulesofwarblog.org. Uh, so uh, if, if somebody from my team could put that into the chat, put that into the Q&A box, I would appreciate it, but you can find all the rules for submission, including where to submit your entries there. We are proud to partner on this event with the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield. Uh, they're a great partner in this. Uh, Corey helped pave the way and open the door to that. And there's some very special prizes ahead beyond just the digital magazine for those winners. So we thank you. Corey, thank you so much once again. Thank you to, to all uh, 100 of you for attending, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye-bye.